Hello everyone, this is Lewis coming to you with the book of Hebrews. We're starting today with chapter 6. And um, it's in my estimation that chapter 6 is a very heavy chapter. Uh, I would like to dig a little deeper than I have been, you know, with the previous five chapters. You know, I, all I've been doing was using what I know as, a, as cross references, you know, with things that I've come to believe with scriptures that I've come to know very um that I've become very acquainted with that that you know chimes in on thoughts that the, the Hebrews writer you know is saying to these people. But chapter six is a special chapter because it's it's not for the um, babies in Christ and where where it begins from here on uh it begins to uh, teach us a little bit more meaty subjects. And so up until this point, even the Hebrews writer said in, uh, in the previous chapter, and I, I want to go back to it, verse 11, it says, Of whom we have many things to say, talking about Jesus, and are hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. That's number one. The Hebrews writer calls them out and says, You are dull of hearing. And, it, and it's not necessarily because of character flaws, but rather that they've been persecuted and they've been um, battle tested. And so in their battle tests and their persecutions, they're, they're coming away rocked. They're coming away stunned by the things that are happening in their lives. And they're really, I've been saying it over and over again, this is just what, what the book of Hebrews is all about. They contemplate, now they're at the point of contemplation where... Maybe we should go back to Judaism and lead this, this Christianity thing. And so they're dull of hearing the things of Christ and going any further than Christ in their walk with Christ because the things that are happening to them in the world. And I've also uh, mentioned uh, how Jesus taught a parable of the sower, how some of the, some of the seed fell on thorny and thorny and thistle thistle ground and it choked because of the cares of the world it choked the word that was preached to them out and so they kind of fall into this into that uh, category where they're in contemplation of being choked out or germinating on good ground and they're like in between those two phases and so they're they're contemplating on just allowing themselves to get choked out and just get getting out of it. And so verse 11 talks about being dull of hearing. Verse 12, it says, are become at such as have need of milk. And if you remember all of Hebrews chapter one, going through chapter five, you'll see the language of becoming or being made being made this even Christ being made this and because Christ was made this and that and the other we are made this and that and the other and we share because we're in Christ the things that Christ has suffered and so to be truly baptized into Christ you are now baptized into everything that Christ means and so in uh, in that vein, in that understanding, we have to understand uh, that we have now become something in Christ and also become other as a result of our denial or our, our faith or our long suffering in the faith of Christ. And so we either become stronger in Christ or we become so weak that we come out of Christ. And we lose hope and we lose the promises and we lose the things that the word of God has promised to us. We allow them to slip. And so the idea behind this is that the word of God has been spoken by God in previous times in manif manifest in different ways. And now in these last days has spoken to us by his son and that word of God remains but if you don't keep that word of God and remain steadfast in the hope, then you're going to allow that word to slip. And so and the, the third thing that I want to point out of the previous chapter in verse 13, 
that strong meat belongs to them who are of full age, who use it. It uh, talking about the word. Who, um, the use of it is talking about the word of righteousness. And their senses are exercised. And so let me just actually read that scripture. Verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Talking about the word. And what comes of the word is righteousness. We explained that in last last uh, last video. And so the word of righteousness, meaning righteousness that comes as a result of us adhering to the word of God, word of righteousness, uh, for he is a babe. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in that word of righteousness, for he is a babe. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul picks it up. In the same idea, verses 1 through 3, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for you are yet carnal. And I'm going to stop right there. And this is where they're at. It is one thing to speak to the Corinthians about their carnality, and I, I explained that also in last last video. Their carnality dealt with them going back into their their flesh, and this is the carnality that you know that people who are, are of Gentile background goes back into. See, the Corinthians were not; it was a mixed mixed cup mix um mixed multitude there. Um, but the prevailing, the prevailing, uh, type of people were the Gentiles in the Corinthian church. And so because of that, what they go back to, they didn't necessarily leave Christ, but were adding to Christ, you know, sensuality and carnal behavior. And so their going back is in the idea of, uh, their carnal behavior as a result, as it relates to their flesh uh, this is the same t same type of thing but it's not that their flesh they're going back to immoral living they're bending and kowtowing to their flesh because their flesh is being beaten by the persecution around them and so it's a different difference there and so these people are babes in that vein in that regard Verse 14, but strong meat, in chapter 5, verse 14, but strong meat belong to them that are full age, even those by, who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern, to discern both good and evil. And so this is the preliminary, pre, preliminary thought <laughs> as we go into chapter 6, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, because of all what I just said, especially the very last three verses that I just read, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, he says, you are dull of hearing, but it is necessary. And in chapter six, you know, the, what he's writing is not because the Hebrews writer deems them able to hear it or able to take these words, these upcoming words, you know, for what it is. But now he's kind of leaving it in the hands of faith these words written on paper to these people and allowing God to, to now do the work in them as far as edifying them and empowering them. Maybe, perhaps, they'll take, take some of the things that I'm about to tell them and let it germinate inside their heart that they may gain more confidence and gain understanding as, you know, before confidence, that they, that they may gain uh, understanding as well as confidence so that they can go on. So this is chapter six is pretty much uh, looking forward to these people actually taking what is now being said, even though the, uh, the Hebrews writer does not deem them able to hear it because they think he thinks or he, she, he or she thinks that the, the audience is not capable because they're dull of hearing, that they are unskillful in the word of righteousness, and that strong meat belongs to those who exercise in in that very word, and have their 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 um their you know they're spiritually strong enough to use that word to be able to discern between good and evil, and 
learn more about Christ and in that, you know, become powerful and able to withstand the, the things that are happening to them. And so now it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let's stop right there, because how is it that the Hebrews writer is saying something like this? Shouldn't we all want to, you know, fulfill the doctrines of Christ? So what is meant by the doctrine of Christ? First of all, let's see what this principle mean. And I looked, I took the liberty of looking it up. A principle is an accepted or professed rule of action or fundamental. Or I, I let me all read that again. An accepted or professed rule of action or conduct or fundamental. And so a principle is a rule, something that is professed as a rule. Something that is um, usually followed by an action because of because of what it is. It is it is a rule. Therefore, we follow the rule. It is in the following of the rule that we keep the principle. And so what is a principle? It is us following the rule. It is our conduct. And so we go further on and the word doctrine of Christ comes up and comes up. So let's look up the word doctrine before I actually uh, define what doctrine of Christ mean in the Bible. Doctrine means a principle. We're going back to that other word. But it's more in, t in terms of a position or a policy, a teaching. And so now an accepted or professed rule of action or conduct as it concerns a principle or a position or a policy or a teaching. And so now we see we're leaving the principles, the rules of the teachings of Christ. You know, the base rules, meaning there is something that we come to know as Christ. But then there's uh, even Christ wants us to move forward from there mature move on and so it also it also says let us go on unto perfection perfection you have to look at the context of every use of the word perfect or perfection in the new testament because a lot of people will come away thinking it means maturity and in which it actually means what it means being perfect whole without blemish and so in this case, it does not mean perfect, whole and without blemish. It just means mature. And so we keep the, what, what the word perfect means in its context. And so we're leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And we're let, and, and he's saying, let us go. Now he's uh, including us again. See, the Hebrews writer is not all saying you people are imperfect. You people do this and you people do that. But he's saying, let us after we have received these principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, meaning maturity. Let us mature in our walk with Christ. And so let's go, let's go and uh, actually look up the term doctrine of Christ. Where do we see it again in, in, in the scripture? Uh, let's look at first Timothy six. I have notes here and I'm, I'm and I'm, kind of scared now because I'm not sure where these notes are leading me to because they look kind of all jumbled up right now but let's go to 1st Timothy chapter 6 1 and 3 chapter 6 verse 1 and 1 and 3 let as many servants are as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed if any man teach otherwise, it's verse 3, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. And then he goes on to say he's proud, he, is, he, is, and, um, he knows nothing, and he's doting about questions. But in what is meant by the doctrine of Christ leads to the doctrine of God. And so this is pretty uh, not really the, the scripture that I wanted to look up. Uh, let's look at 2 John 1, verse 9 and 10. 2 John chapter 1, 
verse 9 and 10, it says, He that saith he is in the light. Wait a minute. Is that it? No. Second John. Uh, sorry, that was first John. Second John, and it's only one chapter. Second John. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Second John, uh, verse 9 and 10. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Look at the, the, the transition there. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. So we've been we've been studying Hebrews chapter one up until today, and and the doctrine of Christ has now finally come up, and we see that John has a definition of what the doctrine of Christ means, and so the doctrine of Christ is now, according to John, Second uh, John verse nine and ten, is um is something that you have to abide in continually. And remember in Hebrews, the, the thing was that they were not abiding, that they were contemplating or leaving and just dismissing Christ and saying, forget this, I'm out. This is too hard for me. And they were about to leave. And so that's not necessarily abiding in Christ. And so we see from uh, 2 John verse 9 and 10 that the doctrine of Christ is something that must be abided into continually. He that abideth, continually abides in the doctrine of Christ. Here's the, the, here's the, the, the actual definition. By abiding in the doctrine of Christ, you have both the Father and the Son. Why? Because the doctrine of Christ is teaching us who Christ is. Christ is the Word of God who comes from the speaker, the Father. And the Father is one God, one Lord. And He has spoken. And He has in these last days spoken. And we call Him Son because of His begetting. It was because He was born. That's when they call Him and He shall be called the Son of God. And so it is because He was born, the Word of God manifest in flesh, He became the Son of God. But we know the truth that the word of God is not just simply the word of God, but is the word, you know, is God himself. But he did not come to earth to be God on earth. He became a man to be 100% a man so that in everything he may understand what man is and what he goes through and be a faithful and high priest as we go further into Hebrews. And so in having the doctrine of Christ, we have both the Father and the Son. And even John, 1 John tells us all, and even in uh, St. John, the, the body of works in St. John, teaches that, you know, that Jesus and the Father, the Son and the Father are one. Not in unity as a person, two persons in one. And, and then when you think about it, where's the Holy Ghost in that matter? But uh, he doesn't mean that at all. He means we're one, meaning we're one and the same. But uh, Jesus did not come to be the father on, on the planet. He came to be the son, the word of God manifested in flesh as a human being called the son. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so this is the doctrine of Christ. But we don't remain there. Once we get that doctrine and understand that right well, we can go on further and, and see other things. And so what is the doctrine of Christ? Once, once, you, once you receive that, what happens? What are these principles that stem from this doctrine? And so let's go on. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let me see what's more. Um, and so I read to you 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 3, which tells us that it is the doctrine of God. The doctrine of Christ, we, we now know from 2 John verse 9 and 10 that the doctrine of Christ is having both the Father and the Son and continuing in that doctrine forever. 
Do you understand? Forever, and you know, abideth. Continually believe in that. Because it is now Christ who will lead you to God. And this is this was his ministry anyway. He was sent to destroy the works of the devil. This is in uh, 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. Let me see. Okay, I'm just right there anyway. Yeah, I think it was 1 John 3, 8. He that committed sin is of the devil. The devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Now, this is 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And even in reading that really quick, um, that just came off the top of my head. When you read it, think about what's being said. The Son of God was manifested, meaning that he was revealed. He was he was um, hidden to begin with. Where was the Son of God manifested? It was in his birth when he became a man and became what he was intended in the mind of God. And so the Logos became manifest in flesh and we called him the Son of God. Of course, that's Luke chapter 1 and Matthew also. So let's see what else we got here. Um, look at Acts chapter 2 verse 42. And these are just a few scriptures. I didn't I didn't get all of the scriptures, you know, regarding uh, the doctrine of God or the doctrine of Christ or doctrines that the apostles taught. This one is in particular, I think, um, by Paul. No, no, this is not Paul. Oh, this is probably Peter. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. When he had finished and they and he explained to them, this promise is unto you and to your children, and to those that are far off. And when they gladly received the word and were baptized, the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 42, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And so we see that the doctrine that God wanted to put forth was put forth through Christ. And the doctrine that Christ taught was of God and therefore was put forth unto his apostles. And the doctrines that the apostles had of Christ is now put forth unto the rest of the world. And so it was, it was another one. Let me look at that really quick. Titus chapter 2. I think this one ties it in beautifully. So if, if this is the first time you've ever heard this, um, you know, share with me what you think, because I, I would like to know what everybody thinks about these particular passages. Have they ever looked at it in those in that regard? So let's look at Titus. Man, I can never find Titus. I know it's about Timothy somewhere. Timothy, though, doesn't know. Oh, here we go. Brand new Bible. Can't open up pages. All right. Um, Titus chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. And I'm going to read it real quick. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Even here in Titus, um, even here Titus, uh, Paul is talking about, you know, um, about conduct, about how we how we act among one 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 one, one with another, <laughs> and so verse eight says, "Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of contra of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you." Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. Again, conduct. That they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Chat, uh, John, 2 John verse 9 and 10 already said that he that hath this doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. Titus chapter 2 tells us that this is the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So God, by his grace, showed us how he was going to save us 
through the word of God that was manifest in these last days. And we called him the son of God. And so this is the doctrine of God. There was another one. Let me go and see if I can find that one. John chapter 7. Which is gonna all uh, is gonna uh, support the idea of where Jesus get this doctrine from? John chapter seven, verse sixteen. Jesus answered them and said, "My doctrine is not mine, but His that sent me. If any man will do His will, he shall know of the doctrine." Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Did I go on further? And that was it. And so we see that even Jesus, while he was on earth, did not regard, uh, did not regard his deity and did not lay a hold on it. And did not, uh, did not uh, take part of his divine prerogatives, you know, as, as the theologians say. But uh, he... Laid that completely to the side and, and was 100% a man on earth, completely subdued under God, under, um, under what would be, because he is in flesh, be, what would be his father. And so why did he pray? He did not pray to himself. He was a man praying to his father. God was 100% a man and his deity was hidden in Christ. Again, where do we get the idea of God hiding himself? In Isaiah 45 and 15. But Jesus says, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. And so therefore, this, this all supports the idea that when Jesus grabbed hold of a doctrine that he was professing with his mouth, that it was given to those who heard him. And the apostles grab hold of the doctrine from Christ. And now it is given to those who hurt them, which is the rest of us. Anybody who reads the word knows what the apostles doctrines are. The apostles doctrine. And the apostles doctrine is the doctrine of Christ. And doctrine, the doctrine of Christ is the doctrine of God. It belongs to God ultimately. And this is what is ultimately meant by one of the stemming, uh, stemming doctrine um, principles or elements of the doctrine of Christ, and this this is where we go where we going in Hebrews chapter. I'm only going to be able to cover Hebrews six one through three. I kind of knew that going in, and so going on to the latter clause of verse, chapter six verse one, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. And so we see from the doctrine of Christ, who we, we know that is also the apostles doctrine. These are things that the apostles taught because Christ taught them. And these are things that Christ taught because God gave it to Christ to teach men. And he gave it to the men who he gave to Christ. And so that's the, the apostles. And so we see this doctrine and the, the principles that, 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 under, that undergirds the doctrine of Christ is repentance from dead works, faith toward God, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrections, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, I can go into, into every last one of these and go, go off on a tangent, but I'm not. I'm going to allow that to just remain what it is. You guys can do some studying. What is it to be, what, what does it mean to, be, um, to have repentance from dead works? We ought to know that. That's the prerequisite to salvation. You must repent. Jesus said, if you do not repent, you will likewise perish. And so repentance is a must. Baptism or uh, faith toward God is a must and we must remain in faith. And so even in this statement, faith toward God, that's why I had um, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 3 and Titus 2, 7 through 11. If you look at what, what, it, what it's meant, 
by having the doctrine of God, it's because Christ now points to God, who is his father, in the doctrine. When we go back to 2 John 9 and 10, it talks about having the doctrine of Christ, having both the father and the son. It means that whatever Christ was teaching, it was something that the father was trying to get through to us. And it's perfectly in line with Hebrews because he's talking about Jesus as the perfect mediator between man and God. Even uh, Timothy talks about there's only one God and one man uh, and one mediator between God and man. That's Christ. And so Christ is that man and he, he points us to God. So the doctrine of Christ is faith toward God. Somebody's trying to call me while I'm doing a video. The do doctrine of Christ is all of these things, but importantly, faith toward God. Because yes, we have faith in Christ, and Christ is the door of the sheep. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by Jesus. And so once we get into that door, what of it? So the kingdom of God is not just having the door, but is entering into the door and receiving the kingdom. And so there's more to be had as far as maturity in Christ. There's more beyond just saying, I have Christ. There's more than just saying, I believe in Jesus. You have to operate in your belief. Okay, this will we do. In verse 3 it says, and this will we do. Talking about all those six things that I mentioned that comes under the doctrine of Christ. This will we do if God permits. And this kind of reminds me of James chapter 4. Let's look at that really quick because I got to get inside. So I hope you're enjoying these, um, these, these tidbits. James chapter 4. Verses 14 through 17 in regards to if God permits. And it kind of reminded me of what James said in chapter 4. It says, Whereas you know not what, you sh what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appear for a little time and that then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James is talking about conduct. And as long as you're alive, you conduct yourselves as though you are Christ and you belong to him. As long as you are alive and you're going to say about anything you do, if it be God's will. And so all of these things, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. A lot of these things we have done and we continue to do. We're not perfect right now as far as, as cre uh, the new creation in Christ Jesus is concerned. We're not perfect. We're not flawless, but we're flawless in Christ. You know, looking ahead towards, you know, a future date, talking about a resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. We're perfect in that regards in faith. If we continue in faith, but as far as our profession, we're not perfect. We're still here. We still must live the day to day life, just like these people who were in, in, in the book of Hebrews all uh, time. They had they, they still had to live this life and with patience, endure it. And they still had to abide by these principles and go further from there, looking unto, you know, uh, looking further from there. And so, and this is, this will we do, and I underline do, and I got 2 Timothy, and this will be my last scripture that I'm going to share, 2 Timothy chapter 3, in regards to, again, conduct. I swear, these book, these brand new Bibles don't give me a, a chance in the world. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 17 it says, these things write I unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Wait a minute, I'm reading the wrong thing. It is about behavior, but it's not the right one. Second Timothy, I'm again in First Timothy. Second 
14 through 17. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the sub subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. Wait a minute. Again, I'm sorry, guys. I, I read the wrong chapter. I was in the wrong book. Now I'm in the wrong chapter in the right book. Now I need to get the right verse. <laughs> so 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's why I was looking confused. It says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Who did we learn them from? From the apostles. And who did the apostles learn them from? From Christ. And who did Christ get them from? From God. It's all going back and leading us towards God. Faith toward God. Okay, verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known, talking about Timothy, the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Now, he's talking about in his lifetime, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works behavior this will we do if god permits the, the will that god wants us to do is the doctrine of christ and every underlying element and principle underneath it we must walk in line with it we cannot do our own thing we must keep our head in this book and so with that i'm going to leave you alone hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 i hope that was a blessing to you guys god bless